In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter addresses new converts in the first three chapters. Then in a number of very interesting ways, he ties their conversion to the church and to the covenant to ancient Israel, uh, bringing images of stones of various types uh, in verses 4 through 8 talking about in verse 9 about a chosen generation and a royal priesthood and a holy nation that is set apart, telling these converts that they are part of the new Israel, even explaining later that the sacrifice that they now give to Christ is a spiritual sacrifice, a, sp a sacrifice of a spiritual nature. Peter then talks in more detail about um, submitting to authority uh, in a way that uh, reflects our article of faith that talks about us being subject to the laws of the land. And then discusses the, the role of servants and how it is that their unjustified suffering reflects the suffering of the Savior himself and has some beautiful and interesting ways of discussing that. Going back then to verse 1, and especially verses 1 through 3, we read uh, <clears throat> this address that Paul gives to new converts. He says, Wherefore, laying aside, now, now that's with reference to laying aside all past sins, because this is what new converts do. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies and envies, and all evil speakings. And it, we could have the word you placed in verse 2. You, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. And uh, there's Peter using that same reference to milk versus meat that Paul used. And then verse 3, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Uh, which is to say, uh, look at the phrase in verse 3, if so be. So if you as new converts have shown the faith to do the things in verse 1, by laying aside malice and guile and hypocrisies, your past sins, if so be, if you have shown the faith to do that, then you have tasted the fruits of discipleship, which is similar, of course, to the fruits of the Spirit, where you, as it says in verse 3, discover because of the fruits that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So that ties in to Galatians chapter 5 when the fruits of the Spirit are described and also ties in to Lehi's dream, really, where the love of God, his gracious nature, is tasted in the form of of a fruit that's picked from a tree. Well, now a new image and uh, several images within an image. We go into a passage now from verses 4 through 8 that discuss stones of several different types. Uh, these are also name titles of the Savior. Living stone in verse 4, uh, chief cornerstone in verse 6, and in verse 8, a stone of stumbling. There's a fourth type of stone that is described in these verses as well, and that is in verse 5 and has reference to members that reflect the light of the living stone, and they're called lively stones. Within these four passages, there's also uh, the metaphor of a house that's being built. There's uh, quite a lot to say about these different types of stones and also about their very interesting connection to ancient Israel. So beginning in verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. All right, before going to living stone, I want to look at this phrase, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Now later in this chapter, 
Peter uses the phrase in verse 11, strangers and pilgrims. That has a similar spirit to it. Those that have embraced the covenant and have forsaken their past lives, as it says in verse 4, are disallowed indeed of men. And that's similar to being strangers and pilgrims. It's also similar to being, as he says in verse 9, a peculiar people. And it's similar to being separate and touching not the unclean thing. So it's all the same theme as being Israel, being set apart. Well, the living stone here is the Savior. And uh, this should bring images to mind of stones in the scriptures for us. We know that there was such a thing as a seer stone that Joseph had in his possession. We know of the Urim and Thummim, which is really a mystery to those who know and love the Old Testament and wonder what the meaning of the, this Urim and Thummim really is. There's, they're, they're, they, they roughly translate uh, to those who don't have the enlightenment of the restored gospel to something approximating one stone that, that is, is a bringer of light and another of truth. Uh, stones that were carried by the high priest that were uh, not part of the ephod, if I'm saying that word correctly, that he wore on his vest. And we've talked a lot about the high priest in the past. But in that ephod, he had 12 stones, and they were uh, arranged in rows of, uh, there, there were four columns and three rows. Uh, those stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so there's another sense in which stones are significant to those who are of the house of Israel, is that each tribe was represented by a beautiful stone. And in fact, the type of stone that each are is listed, I think, in ex Exodus, but maybe Leviticus. So a seer stone could be likened to a living stone. We know that the brother of Jared had a, a kind of an interesting and compelling relationship with stones that gave off light. Uh, so stones are, 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 are part of the imagery of Scripture um, as we appeal to the most ancient texts that we have uh, to learn more about God and being God's people. We do encounter stones of one sort or another. So in this case, in verse 4, a living stone is likened to Christ, and it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, I, it, it could be that a living stone here is really just synonymous with a lively stone in verse 5. I've, I've described this in two different ways, and I don't know which way is appropriate. The, the first way just to clarify, would be to refer to a living stone in verse 4 as the Savior. And the other way would be to add that in verse 5, the lively stones reflect the light of the Savior. The lively stones would be members of the house of Israel, you and I. Um, but the other way of interpreting this is that living stone and lively stones, as they're expressed in verses 4 and 5, both have reference to these covenant members <clears throat> of the house of Israel. And this phrase is not to be missed in verse 5, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And I alluded to that a few minutes ago. As opposed and as contrasted with the blood sacrifices that were offered up until the time of Christ. And we're being assured by Peter that these spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I'd also add with this, this imagery of stones, that Isaiah was fond of this image as well and, uh, and, uh, and said this very interesting thing in Isaiah 54. This is verses 11 and 12. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. This could have reference to several different things, um, including the, 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 the beauty that is in our temples today and the stones that um, adorn our temples. Uh, it's interesting, for example, that the windows in the Washington, D.C. temple uh, are covered with a, a, a translucent stone. 
So stone is certainly a part uh, of the imagery of these four verses, or excuse me, these, yeah, these five verses, four through eight, but also of the history of the house of Israel. Then verse six, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Okay, so now if it's the second interpretation that I offered for the living stone and the lively stones, this is the first time we are um, introduced to this great stone, the chief cornerstone, which is elect and precious, and this is the state is the Savior, and he that believeth on this Savior shall not be confounded. Now that language is interesting, he that believeth on him, because the Savior himself, and this these are Peter's words, remember, who had heard this. The Savior himself said that he was the resurrection and the life, and that he that believeth on him, though he were dead, yet should he live. I changed the tenses in that verse. Verse 7 says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. So who have that abiding belief in the Savior, the chief cornerstone, though he were dead, yet he shall live. But unto them... Oh, okay, and, and so that's the end of that statement, sorry. Unto you therefore which believe he, the chief cornerstone, is precious. All right, now we're introduced to a new role that the Savior plays, and he's a different kind of stone unto those, which it says in verse 7, unto them which be disobedient. So in that case, it's the stone which the builders disallowed. The same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So Peter is teaching us that if you believe, and that, of course, implies following his gospel, uh, then he is your cornerstone, your chief cornerstone. However, if you doubt and go in a different direction and disobey, as it says in verse 7, then he becomes, instead of your chief cornerstone, he becomes your stone of stumbling, now, what, what are we to take from that image? Uh, there are several things. And in fact, I'd like to point something out briefly before discussing the obvious, which is what a stone of stumbling is and, and what role it, it plays in this imagery. But I'd like to point out that, uh, that there is, there is um, a dichotomy that is set forth between believing as it says in verse 7, unto the, you therefore which believe, and disobeying. So that's the dichotomy that's set up. Now, wouldn't this dichotomy be better expressed as belief versus unbelief, or obedience versus disobedience, versus disobedience? I think what we might be able to take from that is that uh, belief is tantamount to obedience, and Unbelief is tantamount to disobedience. And so those words are interchangeable in this verse, in verse 7. And that is because of the relationship between belief and obedience. And in fact, we find the Savior saying in the seventh chapter of John that if any man will do my will, he shall know the doctrine. So there's this connection between knowing the doctrine and doing his will. And so if you are disobedient, that is the same as not believing, but there is an inextricable relationship between those two things. Well, that's the first point I wanted to point out. The other is just to look with a little more depth at this phrase, stone of stumbling, and, and why would it be um, that the Savior would be a stone of stumbling, as it says in verse 8, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. Well, uh, Isaiah expands on this as well. Let me read his verses and then come back to the answer as to why the Savior would be a stone of stumbling to the disobedient, or as we've established, to those who don't believe. <clears throat> 
Isaiah chapter 8, verses 14 and 15 read, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. Peter would have understood this well. And uh, we're going to go into an episode a little later in this chapter where Peter hearkens to a different uh, passage in Isaiah. So Peter is pulling a lot from Isaiah in this uh, beautiful epistle. Well, what Peter seems to have understood in bringing this image up in connection with the other stones is that uh, the Savior would be a barrier in the path of those who wish to be disobedient. Uh, that's probably the most succinct, succinct way of putting it. He, he becomes a barrier uh, in a very good way. Elder Holland, uh, in a fairly recent talk about the Book of Mormon, uh, used similar language, but instead of uh, directly referring to the Savior as a stone of stumbling, he referred to the Book of Mormon this is from a talk um, in October 2009 uh, called Safety for the Soul by Elder Holland, where he bears powerful testimony of the Book of Mormon. I want to read a couple paragraphs from that, and we can see how it relates to this idea of the Savior being a stone of stumbling. Says Elder Holland, For 179 years this book has been examined and attacked, denied and deconstructed, targeted and torn apart like perhaps no other book in modern religious history, perhaps like no other book in any religious history, and it still stands. Failed theories about its origins have been born and parroted and have died, from Ethan Smith to Solomon Spaulding to deranged paranoid to cunning genius. None of these frankly pathetic answers for this book has ever withstood examination because there is no other answer than the one Joseph gave as its young, unlearned translator. In this I stand with my own great-grandfather, who said simply enough, No wicked man could write such a book as this, and no good man would write it, unless it were true and he were commanded of God to do so. Elder Holland's grandfather in this case is George Cannon, by the way. And then this paragraph that brings us to the point. I testify that one cannot come to full faith in this latter-day work and thereby find the fullest measure of peace and comfort in these our times until he or she embraces the divinity of the Book of Mormon and the Lord Jesus Christ of whom it testifies. If anyone is foolish enough or misled enough to reject 531 pages of a heretofore unknown text teeming with literary and Semitic complexity without honestly attempting to account for the origin of those pages, especially without accounting for their powerful witness of Jesus Christ and the profound spiritual impact that witness has on what is now tens of millions of readers. If that is the case, then such a person, elect or otherwise, has been deceived. And if he or she leaves this church it must be done by crawling over or under or around the Book of Mormon to make that exit. In that sense, the Book of Mormon is what Christ himself was said to be, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, a barrier in the path of one who wishes not to believe in this work. Witnesses, even witnesses who were for a time hostile to Joseph, testified to their death that they had seen an angel and, it ha and had handled the plates, they have been shown unto us by the power of God, and not of man, they declared. Wherefore, we know of a surety that the work is true. Well, I, I could have uh, read a shorter portion of that passage, uh, coming right to the point where it says that the Book of Mormon is like Christ in this sense. Um, as Elder Holland says, in that sense, the Book of Mormon is what Christ himself was said to be, a stone of stumbling or rock of offense. And then talks about having to crawl over or under or around 
the Book of Mormon to make their exit. So you can imagine in this imagery that um, Peter is sharing with us that in this in this structure that is built upon a chief cornerstone in order to leave that structure, that's what you'd have to do, would be to crawl over or under or around, as Elder Holland says. Well, now we move to verse 9 which has uh, probably the most oft-quoted verse from uh, this particular chapter, and really one of the most oft-quoted verses from First Peter, that says, uh, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and a an holy nation. And by the way, that's a quote from Exodus 19.6, a, a rough quote, when it says a royal priesthood and a an holy nation. In Exodus 19.6, it says a royal kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. But we see from that that Peter is pulling from the Old Testament to make his points and to strengthen them and uh, teaching these new converts that they are a part of the old Israel by being a part of new Israel with their new spiritual sacrifices that they're offering up, as he says in verse 5. And then uses this phrase, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I think that's a really beautiful way of expressing the process of conversion, being called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, I think that um, what we do from day to day is also a microcosm of that process when we follow that light out of darkness. Well, to the to the word peculiar, uh, the best um, commentary on this word to help us understand that it's not a pejorative in any way or it's not negative is from President Nelson who gives us the um, Hebrew word that was rendered into peculiar and also the Greek word that was rendered into peculiar. Well the Hebrew word is segula and it, it turns out that that translates very well into valued property or treasure. And the Greek word is peripoesis, and that translates very well into possession or an obtaining. And so if you bring this Hebrew word and the Greek word, segula and peripoesis, together and combine them, we find that a, a very suitable meaning for this passage when it says peculiar people would be to say that that we are, or the covenant people are, a valued treasure made or selected by God. Now verse 10 is an extension of verse 9, saying that which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So it's the new Israel it's a, a, a collective notion of this group of people that were not uh, a group of identifiable people that were bound together by covenant to bear up one another's burdens and to have a disposition of love and charity one to another, as Peter said in the previous chapter. And uh, I, I, this, this phrase, which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy, is so reminiscent of... of um, I was lost, but now I am found. Uh, and there's a, another beautiful way of talking about moving from the darkness into the light. So these two verses, 9 and 10, um, give us such a, a, a sense of what it means to be converted and to be members of the new Israel. Well, now um, Peter continues with some of these threads through the rest of the chapter, but talks about some specific things. So in verses 11 through 17, talks about the necessity of accepting local authority. And this is really apropos for the people that he's writing to in these five provinces of, again, what is today modern-day Turkey, uh, because they were under such duress and they were oppressed so much, and their, their suffering was not justified. Um, 
But Peter is going to address this and tell them that it's still important for them to be subject to these rulers. There's some nuance to this, too, that I'll come to um, in verse 12. But first of all, in verse 11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And I pointed that phrase out earlier. I love that phrase, and I love Alma's um, description of us being wanderers in a strange land. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There's another continuation of that thread throughout the New Testament, that theme of the battle of flesh versus spirit. And then in verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be your good works. Oh, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, Glorify God in the day of visitation, which is to say that in the end, it will be by your good works that will vindicate you and prosecute them. And uh, when it says that they speak against you as evildoers, that could have reference to what I mentioned in the previous chapter, when, when the Christians may have been framed, basically, for having uh, started a fire in the Roman kingdom. And I, I don't know enough about it to know where that fire w was, was started, but there, the idea by some historians is that that was actually directed by, by Nero himself, the emperor. Um, so really, so it is today, though. Uh, we can look at this more broadly when it says they speak against you as evildoers because in a world today when uh, good has become evil and evil has become regarded as good, as Isaiah expressed it, we can then be described as being evildoers by those who espouse uh, many of the secular philosophies that are prevalent today. And the only thing that we can really do in, in that situation, just like these ancient saints, is to allow our good works to be the ultimate tell uh, of what it is that we really are. And um, that's all we really can hope for uh, as, a, as, a, as a rebuttal to such accusations. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And we're not talking about holy priesthood ordinances here. We're talking about being subject to Roman law, whether it be to the king or uh, the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And that's another way of expressing that idea in verse 12. And that's a powerful statement. Sometimes that is the only way that you can put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Entering the arena of contention and argumentation, it does have its place in the establishment of ideas in a secular world. Uh, but in this particular case, sometimes there, there's not much you can say but to continue on with your well-doing. Um, then, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, because that's what you could do, with your liberty, but instead as the servants of God. And then in summary of this whole concept, he says in verse 17, these three, uh, four, four sentences, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So, so do all those things, love the brotherhood and fear God, uh, but also honor the king and honor all men. And you do that as well as you can. Now, uh, Peter turns his comments now to servants who also uh, would have been among these new converts that he's addressing in 1 Peter chapter 2. And he introduces them, essentially, to the great suffering servant that we learn about in Isaiah 53. And he... he calls that image forth and talks in more detail about buffetings. He uses the word buffeted in verse 20 and also talks about being healed by his stripes. And we'll talk in a moment about what stripes are. So let's start in verse 18. 
servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, but only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This idea of suffering wrongfully was expressed very well by Elder Alexander B. Morrison. I want to read that quickly. Peter, the great apostle who himself suffered a martyr's death, recognized that divine merit is associated with patient suffering for Christ's sake, but that little glory accrues to us if we suffer for our own sins. Little gr glory accrues to us if we suffer for our own sins. As we endure undeserved suffering, we develop Christ-like attributes that perfect our souls and bring us closer to him. So Elder Morrison is talking here, he uses the phrase undeserved suffering or the term undeserved suffering. And uh, Peter in verse 19 uses the term suffering wrongfully. So Elder Morrison is expanding this and referring to undeserved suffering as almost a tool or a mechanism that is something that the Lord does use and that is incident to mortality and that through that tool or mechanism of undeserved suffering we can develop Christ-like attributes that do perfect our souls and bring us closer to him. And this, of course, is a, another way, an additional way of expressing the concept of fiery trials that Peter spoke of so eloquently in the previous chapter. So he says in verse 20, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto ye were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And so Peter uh, calls, calls to mind the image, uh, the, or the standard, I should say, of the Savior and of his suffering. Uh, to a people who were suffering terribly. It um, re reminds you a bit of the Lord telling Joseph that he wasn't yet as Job. And in a way, Peter is saying, you're not yet as the Savior. And let me tell you more about the Savior as a suffering servant. And that's the phrase that is often used in connection with Isaiah chapter 53, that beautiful chapter. No one spoke more eloquently of the undeserved suffering experienced by the great Jehovah who came to earth as Jesus of Nazareth. I want to read those verses, Isaiah 53, 5 through 12. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. <clears throat> Talking there about the, the, the father and how he, um, Isaiah is expanding on the idea that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, which is hard to read, but he, he's seeing that the Savior completed his work and the, the Lord is justified in, his, in, in this um, allowal of allowing the Savior to be bruised uh, because now of the knowledge that his righteous servant, as it says in verse 11, uh, can justify many and, and bear now their iniquities. <clears throat> 
Uh, this is just beautiful. And then in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. So the great high priest will penetrate the veil and carry us upon his shoulders through it, through the real veil of death, and uh, will divide the spoil with us as joint heirs with the Father as we are reconciled to him through Christ and sit again with him as heirs of all that the Father hath, male and female, as an exalted composite entity that has progressed through that covenant way. And then the verse ends, Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's what Peter is calling to mind, is that <clears throat> suffering servant passage. You know, Peter uh, plays a, a, a fascinating role here because being well aware of this passage, uh, Peter was more aware than probably anyone else of what it is that the Savior did experience, especially during his final days and hours, uh, because Peter was with him as much as anyone was. And Peter uh, saw these words from Isaiah come about. He saw the suffering that the Savior endured and saw how he handled the undeserved suffering. And so here's Peter's way of expressing this. In verse 22, he says, this is Peter's own way of summarizing this suffering servant psalm from Isaiah. He says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And that's how the chapter ends. And we see in that beautiful passage then, again, from verses 23 through 25, that's basically Peter's retelling of Isaiah's suffering servant. What, are, what is the meaning of stripes as we see those in verse 24 when it says, By whose stripes ye were healed. Stripes um, mean bruise, is what they mean. Um, they also can have reference to a, a welt. Uh, it, that can be a bloody welt that results from the lashing of a whip, and that would create a stripe along your back. Uh, the imagery of that is, is stunning and humbling to consider that the Savior was given stripes, and it's through those stripes that were healed, uh, Isaiah's language. In verse 20, when we read the word buffeted, where, 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 the, where, where Peter is talking about these poor saints who lived in these five provinces being buffeted for their faults, uh, he then contrasts that ultimately with being healed through the Savior's stripes. Buffeted translates, by the way, <clears throat> to being struck with fists. Well, this is a beautiful chapter, and Peter's perspective is so unique. Uh, to repeat this one more time, uh, in mortality, Peter saw the suffering servant come true. Uh, he spoke of this uh, really this subject with more authority than anyone else really could. Uh, and then, as if that were not dramatic enough, Peter himself was made subject to many of the same types of suffering. In the end, our understanding is that he too was crucified. We won't all be called upon to endure uh, hardships to that degree or to suffer as a type 
of the suffering servant, but we too can gain a deep conviction about the way in which the Savior suffered and how it is as a result that he can succor us. The most poignant example of that that I know of is Nephi, who did not interact with the Savior in mortality as Peter did, but through revelation was able to gain the same conviction. And Nephi offers us yet another retelling of Isaiah's suffering servant psalm. And that's in chapter 19 of verse 9, which reads, uh, of 1 Nephi, which reads, And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it, and they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men.